Welcome everyone, we're in week eight. I am recording our lecture this week because of Thanksgiving this week. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. I hope you get some time to relax, recoup, spend time with family, friends, whomever your community is, um, making sure that we are looking ahead to next week, which is gonna be our um, exam number three. Several review sessions will be held this week. Please make sure to attend them. Um, I will post the recordings. If you are unable to attend, we will not be holding ours on Friday due to the holiday for the college. So know that I will post um, those reviews that are out. For tonight's lecture, what I decided to do was cover the key points in almost all of the chapters that we have tonight. There were several um, chapters that I asked you guys to read. I sh you should see feedback on your group projects at this point. Grades have been submitted. Um, good work on most of them. If you have any questions on your grading or how we came up with it, certainly schedule a time to meet with me. Uh, make sure all of our stuff is getting in on time. Our Sunday is our due date for most assignments, unless it's a discussion like this week, which was due on Wednesday. Um, and in your responses on discussions, you know, guys, you really want to quote um, use APA sources. I will let you know I created a PowerPoint tonight that I can share with you if you're interested. I'm going to do it via Zoom. Um, we're going to start tonight because we look at cultural competency as one of our big um, topics that we're going to look at tonight. And that's really just sensitivity to the different cultures and in communities. We're going to see several. So I'm going to share a video with you that we're going to take a look at. And then we'll do a bit of lecturing as well. Okay, so this comes out of the Yale, the, um, sorry, the Yale um, School of Public Health. And I'm trying to share, let's share again. I'm just trying to get our volume up. There we go. All right, so we're gonna take a look at this video. In the last 50 years, nearly 40 million immigrants have migrated to the U.S. By 2055, researchers predict that over half the American population will hail from non-American descent. And every single individual, no matter where they come from or where they go, has the right to belong here. Over the last decade, leaders in the medical and public health fields have pushed for the integration of cultural competence into standard curriculums. They understand that competent care is a crucial step to reduce health inequities in our communities. However, teaching cultural competence in a classroom is not enough. Studies show that professionals struggle to apply the competence in context with their patients and clients. This weakness leads to members of our communities feeling unwelcome. Patients then have lowered adherence to treatment plans, increasing health care costs, and hospital readmissions, bringing them back into contact with incompetent care. So how do we stop this cycle? We teach our future generations to use intersectionality and the socio-ecologic model to create sustainable solutions. We teach ourselves to look at our neighbors in a way that respects their identities and narratives. We must better equip ourselves to think like the communities we serve, because together we represent the diverse microcosms of our world. Cultural competence should be a standard in the work we do. Our communities need it. Because no matter where you're from, when you're here, you belong. All right. So I really enjoyed that video just because it helped us see the different um, the different cultures that we may be dealing with. And, and when you go into a community, you're not really sure who's going to be in that community, what their belief systems are going to be. And that's why we need our cultural competency. So we're going to take a look at our PowerPoint. All of the material on the PowerPoint, I got straight out of our textbook. And what I do want to let you know is, is that I um, did not put quotation marks around it, but I will tell you that it is um, straight out of our textbook. So let me just grab our PowerPoint. And we're going to take a look at that. Okay, so um, our first topic is going to be cultural competency. What things are we going to need to consider when we are with um, with our different cultures? So take a look right now, and we're going to do a nice slideshow for this. 
right? So what needs to be considered when we're valuing the cultural uh, differences and the different groups that we see? We need to remember that in addition to financial constraints, our immigration population is gonna have our language barriers, some differences in social, religious, cultural backgrounds, providers lack of knowledge about high-risk diseases in their specific group. The fact that many immigrants can rely on that non-traditional healing uh, non-traditional medicine, so they may use different healing techniques, um, herbs and spices and things like that to help them cope. And we need to really be uh, understanding of that and um, have them describe it to us exactly what the use is and why they use it. And it, the key thing on this to remember with our immigrants and um, our different cultures is if there's an inability to speak English, um, it often accesses, you know, changes their health care or even their need or want to seek it. So skills we need to use when we're working with these uh, different populations, know yourself and how culture influences you, know the families and health seeking behaviors, know about holidays, know who attends them, know the communities you serve, the way you can do that, you can take a course, go to religious functions, religious meetings, informal resources, learn how the community deals with common illnesses and events, and try to see things from the viewpoint of the client, family, and community. Remember, we, as nurses, we need to be careful with our own biases. So when we're looking at a different population, let's try to remove ourselves from that and get to know their community and where they come from. When we develop cultural competency, we look at two main principles. We're going to have a broad objective open attitude towards individuals and their cultures and know that individuals are not all alike. Points to remember, culture is applicable to groups of whites, such as Italians or Irishes, as well as to racial and ethnic minorities. So to look at a group of people and say, oh, they behave like I do because their skin color is the same as mine. Remember, they may come from a very different environment than you did. So during each interaction with clients, we're going to be sensitive to the cultural implications. We had a question on our last exam about um, Mexican um, migrant workers and what they would do, they would need to know. So I want you to focus in this chapter about the different points they bring up about cultures. Remember, there's a lot of diversity that exists within groups. Uh, misunderstandings may arise. And so what you need to do when that occurs is you're going to look at the problem Take responsibility. See, did any of your um, biases come into effect there? Be knowledgeable about cultural high, her, your own cultural high, heritage, biases, beliefs, values, and practices. We're going to avoid making assumptions, assumptions about nonverbal cues. Remember, some cultures don't look you in the eye, but that is just cultural. That is not something that is um, should be seen as unusual. You really need to have a strong basis on the clients that you're working with in the community. So before you go out and do community nursing, best thing to do is to surveil the community, see who's there and see um, what their beliefs are, cultural, religious practices, things like that, what kind of um, religious sanctuaries do they have, things like that. Know that developing cultural competence, which is an understanding of our different communities, is ongoing and evolving. This takes us into our next work, which is case management. Case management is something you will see in community nursing a great deal. Um, a lot of the insurance companies are now implementing case management as a strategy to help with care management, really. So care management is where we're going to see um, we monitor the health status resources and come to an outcome. So we target um, our community or our population. What we want to do is our ability to self um, optimize self-care of individuals and the capacity of systems and communities to coordinate and provide services. This triangle is a nice demonstration of case management. Collaboration, coordination, and communication is on the outskirts. We then have our three, P three parts, our community, where they are living, our payer, their insurance, how does that impact, and their healthcare team, okay? And the client and the case manager in the center of that triangle. And with that, you're doing a lot of advocacy. Like I said, we're trying to do self-promotion here, assessment, planning, and facilitation, okay? 
Two major skills that we need are advocacy. We need to advocate to make sure that our autonomy and self-determination for our clients is of high degree of independence and make sure all parts of the patient are taken care of. So if you are working with a client who has different medications um, and they need to be taught about them and one health office is doing one thing and one is doing something else, and then oftentimes you'll see a lack there, um, you want to educate, support, and that's our collaboration among our, our healthcare team. Levels of prevention as we relate to case management. So primary is going to be prevent. Use the information to understand how clients use our healthcare system. And then secondary, we're going to look at health problems in our population and um, holistic assessments and interventions that can slow our disease. And then tertiary monitor use of prescription medications and how do we adhere to it for illness. Um, our case management overlaps with ethics and that's another chapter for tonight's reading, but I did it in relation to case management. So there's many different things that we wanna look at here. Beneficence is gonna be our doing good and this is all gonna be dictated by our code of ethics by the American Nurses Association. And so we also have justice, which is gonna be equal distribution of healthcare. We have non-maleficence, non which is doing no harm and veracity, which is truth telling. And on this slide, I gave you some examples. So for example, with case managers, we're incorporating outcome measured evidence-based practice, practice and monitoring progress to make sure that we are doing no harm. Um, we want to look at doing good and make sure it's not impaired by our costs. And, um, you know, I don't get paid enough to do this or I'm not here for enough hours as the case manager. And so we want to make sure we're improving health and relieving suffering. Our ethics was is a whole chapter and I want you to review that, but I'm hoping at this point you've reviewed your code of ethics by the American Nurses Association. I would ask you to do that. Go onto the internet and review that code. That'll give you some um, basis for how we make our decision making as nurses. And um, eth ethics is a real, it could be a whole class on its own and a whole another lecture, but I just wanted to emphasize our four main points here and how they interact with case management. We then continue on and we go into disaster, any human or made um, or natural event that causes disruption, destruction, devastation, and that's going to require some other access. We have natural ones and we have man-made. So natural is going to be like a hurricanes, tornadoes, hailstorms, cyclones, blizzards, lightning. Human-made is going to be conventional warfare like nuclear, chemical, um, I'm sorry, non-conventional, which is going to be nuclear and chemical conventional, which is going to be, you know, our armed force, our armed guns and things like that. Transportation, like buses, structural collapse, as we've seen a couple of times over the past couple of years, explosions and explosions and bombings, which we know 9-11. Um, if you weren't alive for that, that's, you probably aren't old enough to be in here, but you may have been very young when you when that happened, but that how that impacted um, nurses, healthcare providers, firefighters, all that. So we want to look at that when we're looking at disasters, pollution, terrorism, cyber attacks. We have Healthy People 2020 objectives, which we always like to know, improve the quality and awareness of information systems for where we can access stuff in the case of a disaster. We're going to reduce infections that are um, caused by pathogens through food because that's going to be a disaster as well. Increase our, um, our influenza and improve the health of Americans. When we're looking at disasters, our job as a community health nurse is going to be many faceted, but we're gonna help our families uh, be Red Cross ready. So we're gonna have them get a kit and then store food for at least three days, water and supplies, keep extra supplies on hand in case you are able to stay in the home. You're gonna teach your patients to keep the kit where easily accessible, make sure to check every six months and replace outdated and do some first aid from the local American Red Cross. You're going to have your clients make plans when preparing with a disaster. You're going to talk with the family as a whole. You're going to plan, learn how to turn off utilities, use life-saving tools such as um, fire extinguishers, know that everyone knows where the emergency information is, and our, our um, prepared plan for members of the family. Make sure it's up to date. 
and make sure we're not forgetting our little pets in the evacuation plans. And for our clients, we really want them to get informed, get the info, know ways that they get information during a disaster or an emergency, know what disasters may occur in the region, and learn first aid is a big one, because in a disaster, you're going to need as many hands on deck as you can. So that pretty much is a quick summary of our disaster and what I want you to know for that. Um, we look at preparedness. Disasters are gonna require us to respond quickly. So public health nurses need to be ready themselves. They need to um, make sure their clients are prepared for any disasters beyond call as needed, but also be sensitive that the nurses may be going through the disaster themselves. Um, people need to be well prepared. We always wanna think about lockdown drills in schools and fire drills. Um, so kids will practice that and practice it and practice it. And when we are doing disaster recovery, what uh, and disaster preparation, I'm sorry, we're going to make sure that we are practicing during a tornado, this is where what we would do during a, um, a blizzard or lightning struck, strike, this is where things would happen, okay? So uh, just remember we're preparing our clients as well, practicing with them um, how you can get out of a disaster situation. We have national guidelines that guide what we do as a society. So we provide a national doctrine, the national response framework, and that gives guidance to the community as a whole. It was updated in uh, 2013 to how the community can work together and how response efforts will be coordinated. With this, um, surveillance comes in, and this is another chapter that we covered this week, and surveillance is really going to help us see um, what's happening in the community, get knowledge about a disease or outbreak, and then we want to know um, why is it happening? We look at all our different things and personal health behaviors, help nurses and others monitor um, infection, bioterrorist outbreaks, and personal health behaviors as well. So, so our, our real purpose is to help public health departments identify trends and unusual disease patterns, trends in our disasters and unusual disease patterns, um, setting priorities and developing evacuation programs for commonly occurring diseases or events. We have two different types. The first is the passive. In the passive case, reports are going to be sent to local health departments by physicians or nurses. Um, and then the case reports are then gone to, you know, they go to these departments and the departments then handle them. So what I want you to remember on passive is, is that the nurse is really not actively engaged in the surveillance, but the nurse is surveilling quietly and then providing it on so that um, others can monitor and, prog and watch the progress of of, of, of an outbreak or illness. With our active system, the nurse as an employee of the health department is going to be going case through case and going to be working with other physicians and agencies. So she's not doing it on her own, okay? Um, going to determine the magnitude of the problem. We're going to make sure that we know actively involved, meaning actively engaging other people. So those are two main surveillance systems that I want you to be aware of in our reading. Um, I do know that readings this week are, are very uh, lengthy, but I'm hoping that you guys have kept up. So our surveillance helps us and draws us right to total quality management and continuous quality improvement. Know that um, when we're surveilling things, like we said back a couple pages ago, we're going to be looking at monitoring and reducing spreads of things. And so to improve our healthcare system as a whole, we're looking to see um, totally quality quality management, which is going to be focused on the client and everybody in the organization. So um, know that it's for our, our patients as well as our employees. If you've ever um, gotten surveys at work, this is a way that we do totally qual total quality management. And then I know that patients are given um, things like the press gainy to answer surveys and say, how did you like the organization? Was there anything you would improve? Kind of like you get sometimes from um, from um, vacations. Oh, how did you like the hotel? What'd you think? Same kind of thing. We're doing quality management here. One of the systems we use for this is going to be our tracer method. And this is most effective in evaluating uh, big groups. So like a hospital, um, a, um, a hospital, uh, urgent care, or something like that. It's really more eff effective in um, looking at the institution than an individual provider. What ends up happening is you have a problem and then you look at that problem and its characteristics 
and see how was it managed, how was it prevented, what was our treatment, what was our rehabilitation, and understand that non-medical factors are going to have a, an effect on any type of surveillance. In the tracer method, they're all going to share they're all gonna share the same kind of grouping. So they're all gonna have the same disease intervention need, same community, same lifestyle and same illness. And the reason for this is that we want to try to, it's kind of like in a, in a study, you know, you have a control group and, a, um, and the study group. And in this, it's gonna be, it's, think of it as a study group. So we're studying, they all have the same, we're trying to minimize the differences there that would impact the outcome. When we look at our levels of prevention for quality management, for primary, we're going to prevent. So we're going to look at a parent education program to get our kids more vaccinated. For a secondary, we're going to look at an agency and how did their immunization program work and then see how has the vaccine prevention uh, declined after the education program. And then our tertiary review of public health report report um, showing a complication from vaccine preventable. Okay, and that takes us to our end. And this, is, like I said, was all from your textbook. I took it actually out of the textbook word for word, instead of going through the book with you guys during this lecture, like I often do highlighting. And so um, I tried to pick out our key points that I wanted you to know. We're going to look at the syllabus and I do want to let you know the last chapter that was your reading this week is national and state guidelines for nursing practice. I did not cover that because you guys are in different states overall, but I would like you to do after um, listening to this lecture or another classes lecture is go to your state board of nursing, see what the expectations are on the state level. And then you can go to things like your CDC and see what, um, what you see the, um, our national government is expecting, or you can go to the National Board of Nursing, that's another one, American Nurses Association, those are gonna be more of our publicly run um, and federally ruled uh, boards that we look at, okay? So I'm gonna stop sharing for a minute. We're gonna pull up our uh, syllabus for the week. We're gonna look at our syllabus, see what we have. Um, what we have going on this week. So let me pull it up and then I will share with you. Okay, we're on our syllabus. And I want you to look at our reading groups. We covered most, oops, we covered most of um, the chapters for your reading. I, like I said, I do want you to go to, I believe it's chapter 28 and do some reading on your own as far as um, federally governed type of things. 14 was our disaster management. We talked about surveillance and outbreak, program management and quality control, our ethics we talked about, cultural influences, how we began our lecture tonight, case management, and then national practices at the local, state, and national levels. Okay, so I want you to read chapter 28 and then go to your board of nursing and see where um, the different variances are from what you read there. For this week as well, we're going to look at week eight modules. You guys had a relatively lighter week this week. And so you had your case study, your review questions, live lecture. And then for this upcoming week, we are going to have our exam on Thursday at our normal scheduled time. You do have your vulnerable population assessment assignment, which is a large uh, scoring on your overall grade. So make sure you have that done. Um, if you have any questions, like I've told you before, you guys send that to me ahead of time. I will look it over. Please make sure you're using APA format. I, I have a hard time um, grading if credit isn't being given where credit is due. Uh, so we'll review again. Exam uh, reviews are this week. I'll post them as they come out. Please make sure that you attend them. Unit exam three next week, Thursday at our eight o'clock class. Please make sure it's downloaded at least two days before. You only have one piece of paper. We'll be proctoring. If you'd like a private review on unit exam three, give me a heads up and I will plan something this week for you. Um, and other than that, have a beautiful Thanksgiving. Enjoy, be thankful for what everyone has. And I'll see you guys next week. Take care.